Hey, Joyful Journey here, Anita Adams here, your host. And today I'm pleased to introduce you to Hren Lizra, one of the foremost somatic healing experts in the world with a big mission in life. Since 2010, Hren has been helping change makers return to their bodies, bringing them into alignment and to their true selves through the power of somatic intelligence and the SI Wisdom Academy. Hren combines her decades of intensive training experience with Cuba's top professional dancers and Cuban embodiment practices with her transformational coaching training on how to naturally heal trauma and generational trauma through somatic practices. Hren has also studied Zen meditation practices and Buddhist living in Japan under the guidance of Guru Nishijima. Drawing on her extensive life experience and her own recovery from deep trauma, Hren has taken that embodied wisdom and developed the power of somatic intelligence and innovative treatment to heal through movement the traumas trapped in the body. Hren has also a specialty in working with the divine feminine energy and has a massively popular TED talk on the subject that has over 12 million views. And I've had the privilege to see that TED talk live. And now I have the distinct pleasure to introduce you to this remarkable woman. Welcome, Kren. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, you did such a good job. I'm excited to meet myself. <laughs> Just well, you, your do. <laughs> you do, you do really have a, 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 a impressive background and body of work. And I have been a fan of yours for a long time. As I said, I, you know, I went and saw your Ted talk because I've been following your journey and I'm so interested in the work you do and all of your body and soul that you bring to everything. It's you just, you're fascinating to watch. Not only are you a stunning human being, but you are stunning inside as well. And I just, I love, I love that I can have you on my show. And then we're both here in Portugal right now, which I think is so cool. When I found out you were in Portugal, I'm like, oh my God, I have to connect it's with such her. such a nice surprise. I haven't been here in a decade. <laughs> Oh, it's just wonderful. So thank you. Thank you for taking the time to be thank here with us. And I know um, the joyful journey or listening is going to get a lot of great stuff out of the things you're going to share today. So where I would like to start, if it's all right with you, is the basics. And I, I can you tell us a little bit more about what is somatic intelligence and how does that play into the most joyful life? So let's start with... Um... Somatic intelligence is the wisdom inside of our bodies. As it says, intelligence, wisdom, and somatic is from the word soma, body. So the wisdom inside of our bodies, over time, we have disconnected from ourselves and our bodies. Now, it used to be very common for us to feel and sense and be in the moment. Even just think of probably your childhood, going from one place to the other. There were no cell phones. You had to be in a moment, whether that was in a bus or a car, and you just had to be with yourself and you felt life. And over time, with all of this like productivity and getting all this technology, we've become so busy that we're constantly keeping our minds busy to the point that we even have words like FOMO. Mm. And we're not present and we're not in our bodies and we really struggle to be with what we feel and sense. Mm. As a result, there's a lot of problems. And when we start to come back to the wisdom that's innate in our bodies, we are coming back to a, a way of life that's a lot more natural for us and better for us. So just to give you an example, um, something as simple, understanding the communication of the body, that's part of the wisdom of the body. So when you're, you get a little bit of a, a sore throat and you start to hurt, your body's signaling that you're doing too much, that you need to slow down, that you're pushing too hard, right? And then you need to take care of yourself. That's a way of communication of the body through feelings and sensations that tells you what you need to do. I have a client, she, when she came to me, before she was my client, one of the complaints that she had is that she went on a trip and she became super sick in her body to the point that she was throwing up. Mm. And she could not understand why she got so sick because she felt it wasn't a physical thing. 
It was an emotional thing and she didn't understand. When we dug deeper, when we understood the wisdom of her body, what her body was trying to signal to her, she was so off her true north. She was doing what was so wrong for her to the point that her body felt sick. Mm. It was that off from like being in dissonance, being in, in a place where it's just so off that her body could not even take it anymore. Mm. So she started to get sick physically. So this is an extreme situation, but there's such a wisdom in our body. And we used to live very connected to it, which impacted our joy, and it impacted our performance, impacted our ability to connect with others, it's impacting our ability to go after what we want. And then over time, we've dis disassociated from the body and from the wisdom. And as a result, we're paying a high price because we don't know we don't know how to come back to it. And so we're not really tuning in and listening to what our body is trying to tell us. Is that what you mean by living an embodied life? Is being really tuned in to what the body is. Is One of the things that I mean by that is, 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 is yes, paying attention, mm -hmm. understanding communication, understanding what it means, learning to self-regulate. Mm -hmm. When you know what is going on, when your body communicates with you, when you understand what it means, when you are able to act on that, you're able, for example, to notice when you get triggered and not act on that, which would save a lot of people a lot of fights, for example, right? <laughs> right. So it's one, one example, but when I'm talking about being embodied, I'm also talking on another layer for this. So for example, embodiment is, is the way that we carry ourselves, how we hold ourselves, the accumulation of all of our experiences. When you see someone sitting like this, like I feel that's like I'm sitting, I'm sitting like that right now. I'm hunched over because I want to be close to my mic and I'm close to the computer. So what what is that? What Open is up that? your chest, for example, right? Okay. So that's something that communicates to a lot of like a lot of the times. Like I was in a wedding and I saw the daughter of, of two participants of the wedding was of a really good friend of mine. And the daughter, her whole body language, she was like 15 or something like that. And her whole body was hunched over. Mm -hmm. And I came to him and I said, you know, I don't want to cry. And if it's not okay, just tell me. I'm just a little concerned for your daughter. Did she go through something? Because her body language speaks like she had, she's gone through something really difficult in her life. Is she okay? And they were really sweet. They were like, thank you so much for asking. And they were like, yeah, she went through something super tough just now in school and impacted mm -hmm. her. They could really tell from the way she was embodied. When we shift, the embodiment, how we carry ourselves, we're also shifting how we live life. So when I'm talking about living an embodied life, I work, for example, with clients, coaching clients, and I shift how they carry themselves. I raise their confidence, for example. And then anything that's incomplete, trauma or anything else that's incomplete will come to the surface and we need to release that to be able to stay there. Because if, let's say you have a low self-esteem and that comes from something that happened to you in your childhood, and you carry yourself like this, and I put you into a place that feels very powerful, now that's going to come out. The whole, everything related to how you feel about yourself and all the limiting beliefs. And and then we have to release that and heal that from the body. So that's being in, living an embodied life, very connected to your body. We're doing an alignment from in to out. So your inner world and outer world are one. I can give you, for example, a hack. And I can show you how to move the energy in the body so that you get rid of, well, I shouldn't say get rid because it will, it, you don't get rid of it, you just manage it differently, but it will shift your anxiety or your stress into a place of grounding and trust in life. And that's something, for example, you talk, you know, um, about the fact that you were at my TED talk. When I was in my TED, I was keeping my energy in the base, which is very, very much a very grounding feeling versus allowing the energy to shoot upwards towards the, the top which gets us more into nervousness mm -hmm. so all of this is wisdom imagine that you're shifting and i do this with clients i shift their energy and suddenly everything changes and they feel differently they can come completely freaked out about something and then we'll do body work and i'll bring the energy to a different place in the body and suddenly they're calm and they go like oh i feel much better now and the breakdown is gone right that's like wouldn't you want to know how to do that yeah absolutely um so i've done uh, some practices in the past, uh, like power poses, you know, where just before going into a meeting, you know, the victory pose, putting your arms up in the airs and, and just standing with your feet apart. And is that the same sort of idea? Or is that sort of like a kindergarten steps towards uh, somatic intelligence? It, it, it's, it's a little bit of that, right? Like you're touching on the little bit of something so much bigger, but yes, that's basically the idea. So what you're talking about, you're talking about power poses that changes the chemistry in the body. And as a result, changes how you feel about yourself in two minutes. 
changing the results. Yeah. So, for example, when I change your embodiment to one, you don't need to stand like Wonder Woman or Superman. <laughs> but if I change your embodiment to one where we hold confidence, in two minutes, your your confidence will change. So it's a little piece of a, a something much bigger. But yes, you're absolutely getting to the right place. Yeah. Okay, cool. Oh, I love it. So, can tell us what got you on this path to wanting to uh, learn about somatic intelligence and and coaching people on this transformational journey? Well, it's a very, it's a very personal journey for me because my mom got mentally sick when I was 11 years old. And um, I think that it was probably the most traumatic things I experienced in life is that suddenly losing my mom emotionally and having someone there who hurt me on a regular basis, not because she was a bad person. My mom was such a beautiful human being, but she was very sick and she didn't know what she was doing. And, you know, to lose your mom at, at 11 years old, like that and definitely not being able to come to her or look for comfort or lean on her. I mean, I've heard my girlfriends talk their whole life about having a mom and running to a mom and, and I've never had that, you know, so that broke for me so many things from, if you can't trust your mom, how can you have trust? Mm -hmm. If your mom hurts you in ways because she doesn't know what she's doing, what happens to your boundaries? Like there's so many things in the foundation that got hurt that I had to figure out like, a way to come together again and not feel broken, not feel damaged. I did feel for so many years so damaged and there was no simple way to resolve it. It took me 25 years to figure the whole picture. And I ran around the world and I was with like, you know, specialists and shamans and plant medicine and you name it. What haven't I tried? So I figured it out, but it took two and a half decades to do that. And when I look now at people and I go like, why should it take them why should it take people two and a half decades to get to the same place, especially though I crystallize the process in coaching where we can do that into the th like three to six months, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and it took forever to figure out. And it's not that common to find the answers for these things. And, you know, when people come to me, a lot of the times they don't even know that they have a trauma. They come to say, you know, this is not working. Or this is, usually you see something not working in your life. It's going to be in a relationship or it's going to be in your career that you're not advancing and you're not necessarily associating it because we don't think of trauma for everything that is trauma. Like, for example, you could say something's not working in in your job. You're trying to get there your whole life and you're not getting to where you want to get to. And there's a frustration like you're failing all the time. When you dig deeper, your parents might have not have the kind of emotional space for you to show up. Mm -hmm. And that might not be a trauma like someone died or someone, something very dramatic. But trauma is not what happened to us. It's how it impacted us. Right. So when something happens and it impacts us on a deep level where we lose the confidence or, or it makes us feel like we're not enough, that's enough to damage something that doesn't allow us to go for what we want. And then we don't understand what's wrong with us that we can't get there. What is wrong is that something got hurt and we don't know to name it and we don't know how to heal it. And as a result, we're not able to go after what we wanted to achieve, whatever it is, love, success, like happiness, whatever it is that we want. So does this, the work you do, uh, do you have to identify what the trauma is to be able to move forward? Or are you able to work with clients without actually identifying that the issue happened when you were two years old, but that you are feeling a, a, a worthilessness and that will deal with the worthilessness regardless of the understanding of how that happened? Really depends on what route you take and your budget. What do I mean by that? Okay. <clears throat> when I'm working with clients one on one, why wouldn't I identify the word cause? I can go straight to where the issue is. And you can do that. You can actually go right to the cause with with this kind of exactly. Work. So what I do is I I develop a process and a method for the somatic intelligence, and I do a somatic intelligence assessment, which is like um an emotional blueprint and X ray of your emotional life of what happened and what, how that impacted you healing somatically into your generational imprint what came through the generations into you and then able to identify what's not working where it's coming from and then going straight to the root cause because when you're healing something you don't want to go to the eco of it if you go to the eco it doesn't disappear you have to go to the root of it to heal it mm -hmm. but if people come for example and they work with us in the wisdom academy not everybody has the budget to do the wisdom academy has incredible programs from both from me and from other mentors from around the world who are top level with things on how to learn about confidence, how to embody confidence and embody femininity and emotional resilience and nutrition through Ayurveda and breath work and sacred sex and 
So like, imagine that you can take the best mentors in the world and come to one place and learn from them rather than having to go to different places in the world and register with each one. Right? So that's a, a way that you can work by yourself, but we're also with you. So right. We've created, for example, a community called the Somatic Inner Circle. And when people come to the academy, we're with them, we're guiding them. So even if they're not working one-on-one -on -one with me, we do once a month, ask Ken and I answer questions and we do a wisdom talk once a month. And so we're guiding them and helping them through that to see what they need so that it's not just, hey, we told you something, but let's make sure you get your breakthrough. Let's make sure that you get your information. Sounds awesome. I love that you're so inclusive with all these different practices as well that can help um, help the individual. I, I imagine it's a, a, almost like creating your spiritual toolkit as you uh, grow as a human being, which is really neat. Uh, so and, and a place for embodied wisdom. Like when I'm thinking about it, it's like there's no platform in the world where we have like somatic or embodied wisdom where you come to learn this wisdom in one place. You know, so that was the, the, what I wanted to do. I was like a one-stop shop where we find all of it, but it's profound, right? Like the profound stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Um, so you said platform. So is um the is the institute the Wisdom Academy? Is that an online um pro uh, school that you go to or a physical school? Yeah, so it's the SI Wisdom Academy, not Wisdom okay. Academy. Pardon so me, pardon me. Oh, it's important because there's a different website that's not ours. Right, <laughs> so yeah, yes. SI Wisdom Academy, which is siwisdomacademy.com. That's an online platform where people can come and join us and be with us the whole year and learn. And from um, all over the world. From all over the world, from the comfort of your home at affordable prices, yes. Very, very cool, very cool. Okay, um, I got another question about, um, you mentioned... Uh, generational trauma. Does that mean trauma from ancestors that have been carried through? Is that what you mean by that? Okay. Great, great question. So the tendency with trauma is for us to pass on the trauma to the next generation unless we do the work. So, you know, when you start to look at what doesn't work, a lot of times when you go one step up, you'll see where the problem is in the parents or parents. And then you go one step up, you'll see where it's coming from. Most of the time, there's a trail be before of how it got transferred. You go like, my mother didn't show any affection. And you go like, okay. And then you start to ask about her mother. And she's like, no, she didn't show any affection because of da 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 da, da. You know, and, and so on and so forth. I mean, it's just a small example, but there's usually a trail. It's important to remember that when humans were created, somewhere along the, the line, it was, first of all, healthy. It was natural. And it got damaged somewhere. So when you feel through that wisdom, that knowledge is in your body. Right. All of that wisdom and all of that development is in your body, which is why when you start working, sometimes you receive kind of like downloads where you realize things or you feel something and it's because it's in your body and you're able to tap into that. As a somatic coach, I can feel into the generations be, like before, especially through the person knowing them because I can feel through them what is going on. And that gives us a lot of information. Also, the lack of information is a lot of information. And what do I mean by that? You start to talk about someone going, no, 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 that part of the family, like, I don't know anything about them. Da, 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 da. And you feel that energy that was blocked and you already know that there was trauma there just from the way no one gets close to it and you can't feel anybody. That in itself is a lot of information as well because you don't think about it. Nobody thinks about it. But you had little children when you became a mother. And the first thing that we always say is, Oh my God, do I do that? Like, did they just copy that for me? Because they start <laughs> to copy you and they learn all these things and you didn't intend to all, transfer. All the reason. bad things. <laughs> right. I'm talking right now about the bad things that you don't want. But it's not the bad thing. It's bad yeah. and good, right? But you transfer onto them because they're like a sponge. They're learning through the body what you transfer to them. What you don't think about is that you also transfer things that came from past generations that were downloaded to you. You know, so for example, my grandma was this really warm embodied in the feminine divine woman and her mother was like that too that generational imprint was incredible and that's just what downloaded there um that's one example but you can see the opposite you can see something that does not work well and download so kids when you see them and who they turn to be and when you look at what's limiting them as adults a lot of the times you'll see what was felt in the family and the generations and what they felt that became a block 
Mm. Oh, you can do that. No, you cannot do that. You believe in yourself. You don't believe in yourself based on what you saw. Your parent is outspoken. You might become outspoken. Your parents are always like a very, always shrinking of fear because of what they experience. You tend to learn to shrink as well, right? So there's, there's information and downloads that happen and there are things that come into us somatically through the body without us even thinking we transfer from generation to generation good things and bad things. Wow, that's fascinating. Trying to uh, identify all those uh, things that happened in our ancestors' lives and and how they're playing out in our in our lives today. I guess that that's where tuning out all the busyness, all the noise, can help you really tune into what's uh, that wisdom, as you say, is uh, within our bodies. So, and I want to add something here. So here's the tricky thing for a lot of humans today, a lot of people today is that we become very afraid to feel. Mm -hmm. And my biggest job mm -hmm. these days is to train people to be able to be through, to move through what is uncomfortable. So one thing we don't realize is that as emotions come up, we need to release them by feeling them, processing them, and releasing from the body. This is why when we see young kids, they go like, ah! And it's like crying, crying, crying. And then like they release it and they go like, hee, hee, hee. And they're running around now. They're happy because yeah. they finished releasing yeah. it. Right? But it's a natural process of letting it go. Oh. Over time, especially with trauma, we lock in. We're afraid to go there. We're afraid to feel. And as a result, we're not allowing processing and releasing from the body. And we become like a storage room that keeps more and more stuff. I was the other day, I mean, this is my everyday working with clients, but I was the other day with a client when she came in, she couldn't even look at me in the eyes at the beginning when we tried to feel it. She was so uncomfortable with the intimacy of being together. And every time I would bring her to feel something and kind of stop her, she would start to go to the mind and start to tell me what she realized and what, you know, bring motivation and inspiration. And over time, I would just stop her each time and go like, so let's just notice it's really hard for you to be here right now with what we're feeling. And we're not making that wrong, but just like, let's notice and see if we can come back to it. And we've done it again and again and again. And this week was a breakthrough where she was able to sit through excruciating pain that from the past I needed to release. And then just like being able to sit with it and not run, which is our our immediate instinct is like, let's run to the other side of the world because who wants to feel this? And we do this first and foremost by calling emotions negative and positive. And we treat pain, for example, as a negative thing that I want to discard. And joy is a positive thing that I want to feel more of. And when we do that, we don't allow for natural processing. You know, you go through a breakup and it's difficult. The best thing you could do is sit with the pain and feel it mm -hmm. and cry it out and just sit and feel your pain. You're going to release it quicker if you can sit with it than if you try to numb and escape. And what people are doing most of the time is numbing. And that could be alcohol, that could be drugs, that could be sex, that could be food, that could be shopping, that could be just being on social media and stuff, but we're numbing, we don't want to feel because we're so afraid of sitting with what is difficult. And that's the bravery that it takes to go through the journey. Wow. Yeah, there's, I, I uh, attended um, a celebration of life um, a few months ago, and it was um, a man my age that took his life. And mm. uh, and he was apparently really depressed and nobody knew it because he kept that stiff upper lip. And I ended up doing a little research in, into that. And apparently it's quite a big phenomenon, uh, particularly among men, because men are told to keep that stiff upper lip. And we're, we're told as a society to sweep our, you know, our problems under the rug and hide them in a closet and not to, to come out with them. And, and I'm glad you're, you're doing the work you're doing because it's so important that we learn to tune in again and allow our feelings to emerge. There's so much wisdom from those feelings. This is an important conversation. Let, let, me, let me just stop here for one second, yeah? Because yeah. You, you went somewhere so important. And one, just to stop for a minute. Because it's like, oh, yeah. there was just such a grief here. This is a good example where we don't want to skip. Just go, and I can feel your heaviness right now. Your chest is like super heavy, and it just feels like ah, yeah, right. And it's so, so sad that we're doing an interview, and exactly, and that sadness is to make room. And that's the kind of work that we do is to allow that is to hey, yeah. instead of talking so much, I'm not talking about the interview when yeah. we talk, talking in life is that instead of sitting and just talking, is to go with one another and say, hey, can we feel that for a minute? 
So that mm -hmm. you're you're offering a tool right now just to, to, to stop your, even just put your hand on your chest. Can we feel that for a moment? It's a really good, yeah. simple tool that anybody can use anytime. Yeah. So when, when I'm feeling you right now, you can feel your pain, your pain right here. Mm -hmm. You've got the whole heaviness, and then there's like the one you to cry a little bit, right? So I'm connected my nervous system to yours so I can feel what you're feeling. Mm -hmm. So when we have that, when someone is able to feel us like that, your nervous system right now is feeling me, feeling you. Mm -hmm. And as a result, that helps you regulate. Mm -hmm. So you get dysregulated and then it's just kind of that resonance. This is what parents do when little children, babies cry, right? You put them on your chest and you feel with them. So it's the same when we become adults. We need someone to feel with us. And the more we're able to do that, the easier it is, the easier it is for us to move through that. And what you said before about um, someone you know, committing suicide, that just reminds me of Twitch, the dancer. And um, Twitch it was exactly that. And I think that was something that took the world by surprise because Stephen Boss Twitch, um, because he was so joyful and everybody saw about him this amazing light. And then he took his own life with a gunshot and it was shocking to everybody because no one knew what he was going through and he was hiding it. And you're absolutely right. The men suffer from this a lot more than women because of the way society treats men when they express vulnerability and we, considering as a weakness. Hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you for presencing all of that and giving us a, a, a little tool that we can use right now, which is really great. Um, let, let's, uh, I, I want to, you mentioned something when we were uh, talking just before the interview about how bringing joy into the work you do is a really important part of, of the trauma recovery. Let's talk about that a little bit. And, you know, like I know that you spent a couple decades in Cuba and that was a, a big part of your joyful journey. So can you, can you just Tell us a little bit about what you learned about living joyfully while you were in Cuba and how you bring that yeah. into work today. Mm -hmm. So um, you're absolutely right that a lot of people work with trauma is very heavy work. Mm -hmm. and, and in my opinion, what was missing a lot of the time is that joy through the body. So, you know, the elements that I work with, three of them are all about that juiciness. And, it's, you know, the tempo, which is all about the enjoyment and the sabrosura is that divine energy, that that sensuality, and then the mystery, the seduction, and the charm that we talked a little bit about before. And um, the first thing I want to say is that if there's one thing that I love about spending two decades in Cuba, is <clears throat> excuse me, is that joy of life that they have. Like they they you're in Cuba, there's a solidarity and there's a joy in life of life. And you realize when you're there, when you spend a lot of time, that we take so much for granted in life and and how lucky we are, but we don't even see it. Like you could be in Cuba, for, I could be there for two months and like there will not be tomatoes in the summer. And I will come out and go like, oh my God, tomatoes, you know, or you go to a supermarket and you have so many options. And then you go to six different stores before you buy what you need. And if there's cheapest one cheese and you come out and go like, whoa, this looks like Disneyland right now. <laughs> so we take so much for granted for in life. And when you're able to realize that a lot of stuff that we take for granted should not be taken for granted, your life feels very rich. That's one aspect of it. But another complete different aspect is that sense of Cubans of disfrutar. Disfrutar comes from the word to enjoy. And Cubans have mastered the ability to reach a state of enjoyment through body movements. So what they're really doing is that they're tapping into a state when, when they're moving, they're so focused on their enjoyment to reach, a, it's a self-pleasuring thing, that they're actually releasing endorphins in the body, reaching a natural high at that time. And when as someone who trained in dance for 10 years, with top professional dancers learning these techniques, it's like when you hit that place, you're like, hey, I'm good. <laughs> like, I'm just so good right now. Let's do this. Like, it's just so good. It's, it's like you're bubbly and you, you replenish energy. I can show you, I did um, an Esther Perel's um, online summit, I think it was about a year ago. He asked me to do a session about the divine energy and, and helping 
practitioners because it was time of COVID to replenish. And I did a whole session of how in five minutes we, we changed their energy. People came with like one, two, up to four, maybe energy. And they left like in eight to 10. And, and we shifted that in, in five minutes. So I think that joy is such an important part. When I'm working with clients one-on-one, -on -one, for example, and we're doing very heavy work, like sometimes I'll stop and I'll say, you know, as a new session arrives and I go, I know you want to keep processing, but let's come back to the body. Let's have, let's bring different energy because like we cannot just be in that heaviness constantly. And by the end, and I go like, what do you think? Like, is that something you want to do? They're like, well, I don't know. Like, I'll trust you. And we'll do it. And by the end of it, they'll go like, that's really what I need. That's just what I need right now. I did not need more processing. And we don't even realize that in that moment, but we have to create a balance in the body it cannot just be heaviness and processing. We also have to bring that joy, that playfulness, that sensuality. And, and that, you know, I love how Cubans call that when we put everything, including the elegance and attention, they call it sabor, flavor. Mm. And they're talking about a person having a flavor, almost like you're an ice cream, you know? So if you have a flavor and <clears throat> the flavors, the way you are, the way you would move, the way you would do it, the way you would enjoy life. And when you're tapping into that sabor, there's there's a, a joie de vivre, there's a, an enjoyment of life that you can't explain that I think is so important for everything in our life, including being able to go after what you want, to be to be able to have the energy, the vitality, the the enjoy the journey, not just to get there, but to enjoy what you're doing. So are you bringing your dance training and background into your coaching practices then? Yeah, I don't usually train people in through dance unless someone comes and says, could you do it through dance because they love dancing, for example. Mm -hmm. I've I've crystallized the process into body movement and body work where you don't have to learn how to dance at all to get there. But sometimes a client could come and say, look, I love dancing. Could you teach me this through dance? We're like, absolutely, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to say more, let's go. <laughs> I mean, playfulness, sure. <laughs> But and and being a, a former student of yours in uh, the <laughs> dancing uh, arena, and my husband too, we w did some yeah. dance classes together with you. Um, I have to, uh, I'd love to endorse how incredible the experience is to learn some of your your dance moves and just getting really in tune with the body and the movement of the body and feeling sensual. It's just, it's luscious. It's beautiful. I love it. I love it. I miss it. I miss doing that sort of thing. So I need to get back into a little movement. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. I love that you that you are bringing that part of of the of the playfulness that I know you as Hren, that you bring that playfulness and that joy into your work that can be perceived as being like really heavy and hard. And so it makes it makes actually a lot of sense to bring that to allow your body to to release, to let go. And a great balance. And a great yeah. Balance. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. Okay, um, divine feminine energy. Let's let's mm -hmm. shift into that. I know it's a big part of what you teach your clients how to tap into it and embrace that. Do you have any tools or tips that you can leave with us today that will help us embrace our define our divine feminine energy? Yeah, so we have we don't work only with women, but we have definitely a lot of women coming and working with us. So we have a specialty in that divine energy. And uh, in Cuba, that's called sabrosura. Uh, the divine feminine energy is this beautiful feminine holding that's beyond a mother holding. Um, that just is innate in our bodies. So you're born with that energy, whether you live connected to it or not. And this is not something that we have to give you. It's something that we need to teach you how to tap into and activate in your body that's already there. And it really comes down to where the person is on the journey. For some women, it's super easy. You just go, hey, let's teach you this. We're like, okay, show me the next level. Show me the advanced. Show me the like the, the stuff that you're talking about, of tapping into these things and activating it. For some women, I'm going to take the other extreme. It's like you start to bring them into that and, and they start to cry mm -hmm. because it's bringing them into what they did not receive. And that's um, difficult to be. I remember that when we did the Esther Perel one, it was men and women, and I tapped them into that softness because we talked about releasing some of what was there. And people started asking, why am I crying right now? And, you know, when we have something that we're holding on to, 
and and we don't know how to let it go. We're we're kind of keeping everything in one place of fear of everything moving like emotionally. And in that sense, it's like we're we're in a sense like this, just holding it in place. Don't just don't move, just don't change. Don't so when you're moving something so soft and you're like, you know, you asked for an, an, an example like of what we can do. So take a breath, for example, slow breath, and we're gonna go. And then we're going to release slow through the mouth. Ah. And really allowing the body to get softer, but mm -hmm. controlled. Right? So I'm breathing in through the nose. And then out almost with a little pleasure. Ah. If you go a little bit more into the pleasure, you'll, let, you'll feel that little bit of letting go. Right? Yeah. right. So we breathe in one more time. And a little bit more pleasure. Ah. And now we're going to do the exact same thing, but we're going to move our shoulders up and down in that same energy, right? So I'm going to breathe in. I'm going to go. And then relax. Ah. You want to control the shoulders a little bit more on the down. Okay. So they don't drop so much. Yeah, like a little softer, almost like that same. Ah, oh, that release. Yes, yeah, so we're going. Shoulders up as you breathe in. Yeah, and then out. Um. I feel oh, like I need to good. close my eyes when I do this. Is that, uh, I don't know, is that a mental block that I, I feel like I have to be uh, more sensual when my <laughs> eyes are closed? <laughs> closing eyes has to do with us feeling like we're being watched. Okay, well, and we are. <laughs> And when you're not used to it, the beginning that's more vulnerable. Yeah. And when we close the eyes, we don't see, so it allows us to relax a little more. So it's not right or wrong. It's just different levels of comfort that we okay. build over time. If it feels more comfortable at the beginning to start with eyes closed, then we just start at the beginning with eyes closed. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. yeah. So for me, for example, that I have a lot of training, I can show that kind of vulnerability and look and feel comfortable with being received in such a way for some people that would feel really intimate at the beginning and it's, it's very like, watching you it's very sensual to watch as well i guess it, it looks beautiful you look beautiful you look radiant with this <laughs> divine feminine energy <laughs> 20 years of training yes <laughs> so there's hope for me <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I, I love showing people the video of 2005. I showed this a lot to my clients. I showed them 2005, what I looked like when I started. Oh. And so to see the comparison, I have the first video of my first training and I'm like, oh my goodness, you see it and go like, what was I thinking? And <laughs> so you have to remember that there's a journey. And when you see the journey, you understand, okay, so it's work. Yeah. It's work that I've done to get there. So as we do this exercise, as you've noticed, we start to kind of get to release, right? Like mm -hmm. some of that tension. For some people, that's things that are really being held right now that as they start to release that some of you like you want to cry and you need to unload. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on what your inner journey, like this is all of this work is about coming home for family to yourself in so many ways and getting into this alignment and into this place of trust and grounding. It's a real coming back home to your body, to yourself, to your true self. And so it's a very profound process. It's not something that, oh, I'm just doing this cute little thing. Like you see this, like the hand. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people go like, how are you moving them like that? Like my hands are so stiff. I go like, it's not your hands that are stiff. What is stiff is your heart. Mm -hmm. Get to the point where you're this soft with your fingers, with your wrists. We have to go is to be able to open up your heart and go through the whole journey of what is there till you really can feel all of it completely. And that gives you that fullness. Like when I do this, I feel full. Mm. Like really full, like full of myself, not full of myself in a bad way, but full of myself, like of that divine energy and feeling so full that you feel in that sense whole. Right. So that fullness is just so beautiful and magical. And from there, when you're connecting with people, you don't come for validation or to fill an empty cup. You're coming with a cup that's full. And now, like, hey, where can we go from there? Like for me, when I came to Cuba, I was already okay cognitively, but my body wasn't okay. And that journey took me deeper, but I got to Cuba because I didn't want to stop at okay. I wanted phenomenal. You know, it took me so long to get to okay that took other people so 
it was so easy for others that I wanted to get to spectacular, to incredible, to, you know, so I kept going, I found it, yeah. And and then it was like, whoa, this was worth the journey. That's so now awesome. everybody else can have it. I love it. I love it. And oh, so if you're li just listening to this, you're going to actually have to go to the, the YouTube version of this so you can watch um, Ren with her movements and sensuality and just it's just so beautiful and, and delicious. Thank you for sharing all of yourself with us. Um, OK, um, your, your TED talk. 12 million views. Well done, you. Why do you think it was so popular? Let's start with the fact that it's somatic. You can feel it. So a lot of people, they talk about stuff, but they're not, it's not being felt. Yeah. I'm not talking about seduction in the sense of like, oh, seduction is this, and seduction is that, and it's in your mind thinking about it. I'm in the seduction, I'm feeling the seduction, I'm making you feel the seduction. When we feel things through the body, it lands faster for us. Let's start with that. You say to a child, don't touch this fire, this is gonna burn. And they've never touched fire before. They're like, oh, mm -hmm. don't touch it. This is dangerous. Like, and what do they do? Go and touch it because they don't understand what it means. The mind doesn't understand it. And they're like, yeah. but they'll never touch it again. <laughs> now they know because their body felt it. We understand faster through the body than through the mind, which is why somatic works give such breakthroughs in such a short time that cognitive work cannot. That's why people can sometimes be for, you know, years. People come and say, I've been years in therapy. And nothing shifted and in three months of doing somatic work something shifts completely because the body we understand faster through the body than through the mind the other thing about the ted talk is that you know we fear seduction but we also want seduction mm. we want fire we want um we want the desirability we want the excitement we want the mystery and not just that, we don't want it just because we want it with someone. Like one of the first things when I teach seduction is that I'll hear from the client, um, I don't want to go there. I mean, I don't want to have to go and do that. And I go like, where are you planning on going and doing that? And the 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 story inside the head is, I'm going to need to go to a pub or a bar and try this on someone. Like that's just the image that goes. And I go, <clears throat> I always say the same thing. You're not doing this for anybody. You're doing it to feel yourself, to feel your own power. And I was with a client like maybe two weeks ago and I was teaching her a whole session of seduction. And um, that that thing came up of like, and I said, put that aside. You don't need to do it anywhere else, but here in this room with me and then let it go. You don't even have to come back to it anymore. So she dared because it wasn't for anybody. I said, it's about you. It's about your self-worth. It's about your confidence. It's about your ability to attract in business, not by seducing someone sexually, by feeling that you have the power to go after what you want, to attract to yourself what you want. It's the power that you feel in your body that opens for you the possibility to do these things. So we did a whole session. The next day she comes back and it's like the transformation in her life. She did this. She she talked to this person. She changed that. She did that. And I stopped her at one point and I said, I just want to acknowledge something for a minute. She said, well, I said, you didn't want to do it yesterday because you thought this and this and you felt this and this. But notice when you allowed yourself to go there and feel it in your body, what opened up in your life, where you dared go. And none of it has to do with sexuality or with relationship or like, you know what I'm saying? So it's like you, your self-worth goes up, you knowing who you are. And when people see it, I hear a lot of people go like, I can't believe your courage. I can't believe your confidence. I wish I had your confidence. I wish I had your courage. And when I ask, what do you mean by courage? You go like the way you stood there and you spoke about it in front of the whole world without being afraid. So let's start with the fact that I was terrified to speak about it. It's not true to say that it wasn't scary to speak about it. It's super scary to talk about um, seduction, especially when the TED team told me ahead of time, if we do this correctly, you're going to have 50% lovers and 50% haters in the world. Are you ready for it? But it was the fact that they asked me that, and I said yes, that I was ready for it. So it wasn't about not, you know, not being afraid. But we are, we want this energy, we want the confidence, we want to speak our truth, we want to have a voice. This is what speaks to people more than the seduction itself. It's what we want. That was the embodiment of it, of daring to stand on that stage and speak of something that we never looked at. Not only that, but I mean, when you go to Cuba, and that was the experience that I wanted to share, I wanted to take the misconceptions that we have, and especially North America, not only, not exclusive, but we see 
seduction and we associate it with pickup artists and we go oh yucky like mm. someone's using that power to manipulate you and take you uh, take something away from you and then you lend someone like Cuba and you see seduction in the most beautiful way where people kind of like use their charm to motivate you and you know that you're being seduced and they're not taking anything from you and by the end of it you left and you're feeling so good and recharged and nothing even happened but you feel so good <laughs> and and it's a whole other way of viewing it yeah. which doesn't have to be sleazy and disgusting right so the context is very important if you go into the TED talk the 12th million you start to read this you'll see that there are lovers and haters and and people with insights in the middle the haters go like you're promoting rape and you're a whore and they'll say horrible things wow the lovers will say oh my god you're amazing make me a baby and then the ones in the middle will be like wow i realized this or this or like they got something from it and when you analyze this even further and you look you'll see the context look at what country they come from right in the u.s they'll, they'll have more of that against you unless they've been they've had an experience where they've experienced this i mean go to latin cultures none of them are saying bad things about the seduction because their experience from their culture being embodied and living in that wisdom where it's not necessarily a negative thing all the time is very different than what they've experienced in north america right so i think it speaks to a lot of people from mm. what they want and desire in life daring and then wanting to be in that energy but also being afraid of it wow well. So interesting. I, I need to go back and watch uh, the TED Talk again. And in fact, I'll include the link in our show notes and we'll add it on, on the, the YouTube version of this. We'll add it as the uh, the additional video uh, that people can go directly to and, and check it out. So super cool. So interesting. There's I feel like we've barely talked, skimmed the surface <laughs> of the things that you and I can, can talk about. Uh, you mentioned that you had a gift to share with the Joyful Journey audience. Tell us, what is it that you are offering? Right. So I know that a lot of the women watching want to learn about some of that embodied femininity. And uh, in the femininetruenature.com, femininetruenature.com, we have uh, a free gift uh, where they can go and do some videos and learn about how to embody their femininity. Oh, beautiful. Awesome. And we'll, we'll make sure we include that link in the show notes as well. So very cool. Thank you for that okay. gift. I'm going to check that out. I, I want that. <laughs> I want to embody <laughs> my femininity. Awesome. Yeah. And for the, for the guys, well, it's also for the women as well. We have a YouTube channel with tons of free videos and we have beautiful covers so you can see what subject speaks to you. We have hundreds of videos, little videos, short ones. So like for all the people that don't like long retention spans, <laughs> um and really just want to watch something quick with a lot of wisdom a lot of embodied wisdom and even practices that people can, can do in, in the youtube channel awesome thank you can i get that link from you as well and we'll put that in the show notes okay, okay that'd be yeah. really fabulous now if, if anybody wanted to connect with you directly to find out more about your programs or just to reach out to you what's the best way for them to do that uh well one Obviously, our site, powersomaticintelligence.com, and people can either register in the um, mailing list or send us a message if they want something specific from us, or um, there's even a four-day challenge that people can join, so there's different things on the site. What's the four-day uh, challenge? The four-day challenge is for embodied femininity, so people jump into a four-day pre-recorded um um challenge and then it's like beautiful breakthroughs the awesome. the response that we've gotten i i've on purpose did a four-day challenge or something that you would expect to do like in a huge program something that's very very simple so um so that we really see results coming from that where people go like oh it's a little thing and then they go like whoa that was profound what i just went through um so <laughs> love it yeah so that's I, very I, I like that it's just four days too like mm -hmm. that's an easy commitment four day challenge yeah four days and you don't need more than half an hour a day and and I did not hold back when I created that so I really took some of the juiciest stuff that we've gotten I put it in there so that very quickly you'll see results in your life and go like oh wow I'm starting to understand and realize things and have new awareness and have a breakthrough here and um and, I, and the, the last place I would say is I love being on Instagram so when I'm on social media, I'm usually on Instagram. That's a good place to look for me. <laughs> what's, what's your user handle? Uh, C-L-I-Z-R-A. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Awesome. 
good stuff. So I am going to sign up for that four day challenge. That sounds amazing. And uh, check out all the other stuff that you've got going on. I might, you might find me as a student uh, down the road. I love the, the stuff that you're doing. It's very uh, inspiring and powerful. So again, thank you so much yeah. and for, for being on the show with us. I know the stuff that you are offering the world will speak to a lot of people, a lot of our listeners. Um, it's really powerful, beautiful work. So thank you again. Thank you for having me. Yeah. All right, Joyful Journeyer, I hope you enjoyed this show. And uh, please, uh, please reach out to either myself or Chen uh, if you want more information about some of the things that she's doing. And uh, yeah, we'll catch you next time. Bye for now. <laughs>